Hello, everyone. Hello, everybody. Oh. It's the middle of September. We finally were, we made it. Yeah, last week. <laughs> last week was rough. Last week was rough. FYI, y'all, we can't see the chat because we're using this amazing platform. Um, that Alex must that working not working is <laughs> diligently working behind the scenes to make this to elevate the series. So yeah. see your chat, but she will save the chat. So please still interact with um, interact with the chat and uh, and and just share where you're tuning in from and you know anything that you resonate with, so we can read it after. Yeah. Because um, I always like, you know, to know where everybody's coming from, where the questions are coming from. So I'm very happy to be here again with you as we continue our equity and practice series. Um, there's always so much to talk about because things change every week. <laughs> Yeah, practice. and that's why it's called equity in practice because you know what we're what we're working towards to create an equitable creative industry or advertising industry or any industry that you work in is something that takes time to build and also it doesn't just happen you have to do it intentionally so that's kind of why we started this series and if you see in the poll section there should be a poll up um, and if you can just tell us where you are in your journey of social consciousness and racial awareness because we're all in different places there is no right or wrong answer we're just curious to know where everyone is yeah i think i teeter between actively advocating and actively unlearning mm -hmm. at the end of the day mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so uh, I mean, I always get it right. That's why, again, like you said, always in practice and always learning, which I, I'm really happy about. Because um, I always feel like expanded when I hear something new, like a new term or a new way, a new perspective. So I think I'm between two. Yeah, yeah. It makes sense because on any given day, it might be different. Maybe we are feeling a little bit, especially depends on the, um, topics too, topics at hand. We might feel more comfortable talk, speaking up when it comes to um, gender equity versus racial equity. Um, so, you know, it really depends on the area. But yeah, as people get settled in, uh, make sure that you respond to the poll. And also, we'll just introduce ourselves for anyone who's joining. Put in the chat if, the, if this is your first equity in practice that you're joining. Um, in if also put in the chat if you've been to our other two series, our previous series. And Jen, do you want to give us a little background? Uh, give the people a little background of how this uh, series began. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody knows after May and all of the unfortunate events that happened, whether it was Mark Marbury or George Floyd, like, unfortunately, there's too many to name, right? There was. I think what's happening is a mass cultural and social meaning. And so, um, you know, working out working, also wanting to put in practice and have conversation, basically reached out to both of us and said, can you talk about how racial equity really impacts our creative industries? And that was like, the, it was just like the spark, right? We came together, we had such a great time and great conversation. And what I think we both loved was how engaged and involved and how appreciative people were of the conversation. And so I'm really happy that we get to do this in partnership with Working Out Working because conversations, like the tool of conversation and shifting perspective is, is part of the timeline of evolution. It's mm -hmm. part of the change that has to happen that we all want to see. And I mean, last year, I, I wouldn't have even, I don't think we could even picture that people would be talking about defunding the police, you know, abolishes, you know, abolish, ab abolishing, can't even talk today, abolishing just like our systems and really 
understanding that white supremacy is uh, it is all a system that we all kind of unfortunately uh, have to deal with, right? Mm -hmm. So bringing it all together in a way, um, those all of those concepts and conversations really turned into this conversation series, Equity in Practice, because we knew this was going to take a long time. Like this is not just like one webinar, one training that we have to do, right? We have to begin to put our new ideas and beliefs in practice. And we do it by ourselves, but we also learn and we do it in community with others. So I'm glad that we get to do this together and lead the conversation, but I'm also glad that people are continuing to show up and you know engage us in the conversation, which I yeah. appreciate. Yeah, and our tone for this kind of what we envision this to be is really just an honest space to for us to be in dialogue with each other. And we understand that a lot of these conversations about um, race and identity and ex racial experiences, racialized experiences, um, pushing for equity in the workplace or personalized, whatever that looks like or whatever that means to you, I know that it can be really overwhelming because we don't know where to start. And that's what we want to talk about today, identifying our areas of advocacy, because there's so many different areas that we can uh, really commit to and push. And it's we're just going to talk about you know how we've identified ours and what we can do, kind of some steps we can take to identify. Um, and also for anyone who's joining us for the first time, um, some quick intros. My name is Jez Chung. Um, I am a creative equity advisor and a transformation facilitator. And to define that, I help organizations and uh, groups of people or individuals create uh, transformation. Mm -hmm. And um, I I center my work around. Um, educating people and, and helping really empower uh, non-dominant identities and non-dominant communities, uh, but I also focus on uh, expression and empowerment through um, creative expression specifically. So that's what I do. And then, Jen, do you want to quickly introduce yourself too for people who yes. are curious? Yeah, um, I am a creative and brand strategist. I'm also a DE and I facilitator. So what that means is I am traditionally a strategist by trade, right? Uh, worked in advertising um, and marketing for over 50 years and, um, you know, have been a freelancer and independent for five of those years. And so my work has evolved over time from working full time and then, you know, kind of pivoting, you know, into an exciting experience of stretching myself as an independent consultant and a freelancer. And so my job is to basically bring community and spirit back into someone's business, right? Um, whether that is understanding, uh, you know, how they can basically be a better brand. And that is work that sits at the cross section of brand, spiritual principles, wellness, and inclusion. So I'm really excited to be um, getting to do the work that's very multidimensional because that's also a collection of who I am as well. So that's sure. me. Nice. And let, um, so today's webinar, we are sectioning it out a bit differently. We're trying something new because as we're growing yeah. the series, we're going to try different things and it's going to evolve. <laughs> so thanks everyone for going on this journey with us. But today we're going to go through um, a learning out loud segment to share things that we've been learning. And we're learning out loud, literally, like just sharing it things as we go, because there's so much power to, you know, not chasing perfection, but just accountability and, um, you know, learning, learning things ourselves. And then uh, we're going to talk about three ways to find your areas of advocacy or lots of ways, actually, um, and, and then go into some uh, tips to take action. What are some actionable things that we can do? Um, and then some rapid fire questions for the end. So to start our learning out loud segment, Jen, what yeah. is something that, uh, what's something that you've been learning lately or in the past week or a few weeks? What's something that uh, has been sitting with you that you want to share? Yeah, I uh, was really um, I really appreciated this new post. It's actually a medium article written by RGA. 
and it's called Make Change. It's a strategy for racial equity in creative companies. And I really loved the way that they laid it out. One, because they were generous enough to um, really pinpoint the problem. Um, and they were very specific in saying, you know, there's not one blanketed way of handling this issue, right? We've been talking about this long enough. <laughs> so let's figure out, you know, a way that is specific to our company, but also could be rolled out over time. And also, this is continuous work. Like, with, this is the work that we will continue to do for moving forward, right, forever and a day. So I really, I really appreciated it. And so I've been really kind of just looking at it. I literally read it once a day because um, I like the framework of make change. It's basically, the way they define it is it's a series of actions we will carry out on an ongoing basis that allows for different groups and offices to take and adapt that puts our current black employees first and that prioritizes action on behalf of the entire company not just leadership or HR. And then there are five actions. Um, and they pointed out that the five actions will run concurrently and each has a different owner, um, which spreads the responsibility of making racial equity everyone's job. So I thought that that was fantastic. And the fact that they're like, here's what we think, go ahead and use it, <laughs> you know? Um, I really like open source. It open source, and I just feel like the intention behind that was so, um, it's it's a great example. It was really, so I really applaud them because it's not only like, oh, this is our strategy, and, you know, uh, make it almost like a competitive advantage, which mm -hmm. it surely will turn out to be, but mm -hmm. also like this is for the benefit of our entire industry. Like, let's just all use it and then tailor it to your company based on your culture. Right. Yeah, I like that a lot. And I like that you've been going back to it too, because I think often we think of some material that we um, are educating ourselves with as like we read it once and then, you know, it's, it's in our brains. But it, there's a difference between uh, learning and integrating. Mm -hmm. And it seems like you're really integrating it by look, going back to every day. And it is so powerful to have even just a blueprint that yeah. people can go and tweak according to their company culture or their spheres of influence or whatever it is because it just to have something to to go off of it. Go, go off of. I think it, and it's like it's not so specific that like oh no this doesn't work for me I you know I, I don't work in a creative agency maybe I work at a law firm yeah you can only apply this to the law you could apply it to any industry and I yeah. think that's what makes the strategy very strong. So yeah, um, yeah I think when we read our, you know, the things that we're reading and um, learning, we have to revisit them. It's good to revisit them because it takes a while for something to sink in. You're seeing it, but you need to comprehend it. You need to really think about what this is applied to me. And then you mm -hmm. have to put it in practice as we, we constantly say. So it always needs to be revisited, at least from, from the way I learned. Yeah. What about you? Yeah. What have you For heard sure. over the past couple of weeks or what have you read that's really captured your 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 head and your heart? I'm really learning not to associate guilt with rest. And I think that this is something that I, I feel like it's a theme. I'm seeing it online too, and I think that's why just um, I'm an Ethos Club member, so uh, Ethos Club is a social wellness platform uh, for and by people of color. So there's uh, just a lot of workshops and, and sessions that are about 45 minutes long, and it just really goes into, I mean, some of it is, you know, rest as a form of revolution or rest as a form of resistance, and it really has been uh, powerful to be in community with people and sometimes I feel like I need permission to feel what I'm feeling just by hearing it from someone else. So when other people are saying, yeah, I'm just resting, I heard um, actually someone at Adco was saying, yeah, I'm just, I decided I'm only going to work two days a week. And I was like, wait, that's possible? Okay. Oh. All right. That sounds really nice, actually. And then we both against, yeah, and, and the thing is, if I'm really trying to abolish uh, abolish the, the police in my mind 
abolish the systems that we've been a part of. And if I'm also, I'm, I've been just slowly reading up on uh, the works of police abol abolitionists like Angela Davis and Marion Kaba and Ruth and Wilson Gilmore because I want to learn more about what uh, the Black Lives Matter organizers and activists on the ground are calling for. And um, and I, I've said this before and I'll continue to say it, it's impossible for us to support the Black Lives Matter movement without supporting their messaging. And their messaging is very clear, defund the police and actually eventually abolish the police and abolish the prison system um, and address the prison industrial complex. And while those words may seem so far removed from our industry and the creative industry, that shows up. Like last webinar, we talked about how white supremacy characteristics show up in our everyday uh, yeah. lives, the ways that we interact with each other. So I realized, oh, this heteropatriarchal capitalist system is telling me you have to work yourself to the ground to prove your worth and you have to make sure that you are just suffering your your suffering is is equivalent to your success and I'm realizing that that's not the case that I can actually um, invite more rest and joy and ease into my life and so I'm really just associating that that uh, guilt from it and um, something that I read in the past uh, a couple of weeks that has really been sitting with me is uh, Angela Davis did, Davis's interview, or Ava DuVernay interviewed Angela Davis for Vanity Fair. And she talks about, Angela Davis talks about how diversity and inclusion kind of become these you know, buzzwords in our industries without substantive change, without radical change, actual big change. Right transformative, you know, organizational systemic change accomplishes nothing. So all right. of these things that, you know, we talk about all these initiatives, speaker series that events are, uh, that agencies and companies are having without actually backing that up with, okay, what are we, what policies are we going to change? What, um, what rules are we going to change in the workplace? Without that, it doesn't really do anything. Right. And yeah. I, you know, as I continue to have more Conversation with other DEI practitioners, you know, um, I always want to make it known <laughs> that people of color, BIPOC people, LGBTQIA people, uh, everyone who is non dominant, they are not the problem. I mean, yes, it's great to have more programs. MAPE is amazing. Like, we need to still have those programs, right? But there still comes a, a bit of a wall because we've had some of these programs in play for almost a decade. And we're at some point, there's still a, a point of drop off for people of color, people who are in marginalized groups. And so then it leads me to believe, obviously the pipeline is not the problem. Obviously the people who you want in the pipeline aren't the problem. You know, this is like the direct expression of white supremacy. And really what it comes down to is people have to understand that you, everyone is affected by white supremacy and whiteness. And so you have to not internalize the racism, but understand how to integrate the change, right? And so I don't think that everyone knows what that is. I think everybody in um, corporate environments and, and companies, you know, want to do instead mm -hmm. of learning how to be different, <laughs> right? So this is this is where the intersection of wellness and spiritual principles comes in because mm -hmm. yes, we can have you know lots of pipeline programs, trainings, mentorships, sponsorships. But at the end of the day, it has to be important to people in the dominant group to make changes. And a lot of rules won't always change that. You have to want to be different, right? Yeah. It's radical change. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I hope that that leaves a little bug in everyone's ear whoever gets to listen to this because, um, you know, the purpose of Jesna having this conversation obviously is to act as a catalyst. Obviously, it's to spark for a conversation and not just have this be a regular you know, diversity and inclusion conversation, but to help you make the, the, the connection and connect the dots between what's happening in the streets and what we have to come to our Zoom meetings with mm -hmm. every day and help you see how does this work. Even down to the, to the 
small starting, I guess I'd say start kit of how, what, how do I advocate for myself? How do I advocate for others? Which is also something you can do. You don't have to be in leadership. You can be whoever you are, whatever type of work you do, there's always room to advocate for others who may not have a, a, a visibility like we do. Mm -hmm. And it's about finding what you're speaking to is also about finding your stake in the ground and really understanding because it does affect everyone. I think racism is not the problem of people of color. It is, you know, that's what Toni Morrison talks so much about this, that racism is a distraction and it, it prevents people from really knowing ourselves. And Black is King, which we talked a little bit about our last uh, our last webinar series, there's a, a line in there, how can, how can I know myself? You know, if, how can you know me if I don't even know myself? Um, or something along those sorts. So it's really about, I mean, there's so many ways to tackle this, but I think, yeah, that's something that you and I found a lot of commonality on and approaching it through wellness because it affects people's bodies. Like it affects people somatically, the way that our postures are. Trauma lives in our bodies and trauma just does not just belong to people with non-dominant identities. Trauma lives in everyone's bodies. Like what have, what did our ancestors do? When our ancestors commit harm to some, to another group of people, that trauma lives with them too. What um, trauma did our ancestors endure? All of these things, but, um, but yeah, to your point, like those areas of advocacy, you know, going back to that, it's, it's something that we can find by asking ourselves some questions that really help get us to, okay, if I'm thinking about, you know, everything that needs to be done, right, in terms of like political change, the economic change, the corporate change, the interpersonal change, all of these things, what is it that I can do based on what I care about? Because we don't have to fake, I think that there's this, this myth that you have to like fake care about something because everyone else does. But I don't think, yeah, I think it's about you know, yeah. find something that you that you resonate with and really lean into that. There's a have you seen that diagram that went on went around on Instagram during uh, when the protests first started happening uh, this year? There were um, there was a diagram like mapping my role in the social change ecosystem. Oh, yes, identifying yes, yes. my role, and it was like the healers, the um, yes. the storytellers, the builders, the visionaries. Which uh, the I so appreciated that. I really did. Yeah. I know me. I am not the person that, like, I kind of deal with trauma <laughs> already. I, I know I'm not going to go in the streets. But there are other things that I know that are part of my inherent gifts that I can lend to my energy to in terms of transforming what I have control over, right? Yeah. And so I yeah, really, I really, really, really love that. Really right? That. Like, what do you have control over? Your sphere of influence. Like, yeah. who are the people that I have direct? Who are the people that report into me or that I report into? Who are the people I interact with on a daily basis? What industry am I in? What, um, you know, who are the, what, am I part of an organization that meets up weekly or something? Am I part of, you know, you know do I have re religious affiliations? And is there an organization or community that, I'm, that I've grown up with? There's so many ways um, that we can, we can tap into that and then ask ourselves, like, what am I, what am I good at? Good at, right. Where are my skill sets, right? I have, this process is, is also very similar to the process I had when I, I made the decision to go freelance. Mm -hmm. And then also saying, okay, what are the skills? What are the things that I really love to do? What am I really passionate about, right? And so that passion, the, the intersection of your passion and your skill set can then lend itself to, okay, now how can I really create a space for me to express and like share my talent with others? Mm -hmm. So maybe that looks like in terms of, again, when you're through the lens of, how can I be an advocate for myself or for others? And that can be other people. That can mean advocacy within an organization. That can mean mm -hmm. advocacy for a nonprofit or for-profit organization. So think about, are you good at making presentations? Do you know Photoshop and InDesign? Can you like help out, right? Um, on social media, maybe you're really great at amplifying um, messages. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you're a really good connector. Right. 
that's like someone who's like, how can I make sure that like I'm donating to creative, you know, collectives? How can I get in touch with, you know, uh, LGBTQIA um, uh, yoga studios who want to, you know, make sure that they're offering somatic classes for them? You know, like someone who is of the community, that's a great person, that's a great way to be an advocate, right? Because then you're connecting the dots for other people physically. And that's really, really important. We need connectors. Um, or if you're just great at really planning events, right? <laughs> someone always needs a great project manager. I'm gonna need you. Well, we need organizers more than ever. We need organizers. We need organizers. <laughs> organizers yeah. are people who are taking action. It's basically, think of it like a project manager for the movement. Yes, <laughs> yes. You know, and really yeah. like, um, and really understanding, yeah, if I like planning things, if I like organizing things, what can I organize? Is it a, you know, so many people are doing book clubs. Uh, so that's one, you know, that's one avenue, but it could also be just a Skillshare session. I love Skillshare sessions. Or you can get on, you know, Zoom or Google Hangouts or FaceTime or whatever it is with people and then say, hey, what are you, what is everyone good at? Everyone assign something and then do like a 10 minute skill share to just yeah. help people understand like this is what, you know, this is what we can do. There's also a, a, a Vanessa Newman at Five Boy, F-I-V-E-B-O-I, it created something called Design to Divest. And it's a collective of designers and strategists yes. um, who are designing for the movement, basically, and for Black-owned right. businesses. And that's something that um, it's made up of not just it centers Black designers, but it's also just it's open to anyone who is uh, wanting to use their designer strategic skills to help uh, help with the movement. But I think that that's that's something that's really powerful too. So yeah, identifying. Yeah. And while you bring up Vanessa, um, Vanessa is also the other recipient of our contributions from our webinar today. So our proceeds, you know, we always want to make sure we're doing equity and practice, right? So we're always finding ways to support people who are of the movement, as you said. And Vanessa Newman is also involved in No Insights, right? Which is a collective for women and non-binary women who um, need resources, um, you know, as you said, skill sharing, um, talent development. Um, so they do a lot in terms of how can we support other people who are like really doing movement. Uh, and they are also the ones who create a strategy for black lives. So again, like they brought together a whole bunch of people knowing like, okay, here's our skill set. How can we help the community? Um, and so we wanted to support them in doing that. Of course, you know, we always are continuing our um, partnership with Ethel's, which um, Jess has been doing such a great job ushering that in a dream investment. So, um, yeah, and I also think like the way that you've been doing advocacy, right? Like you're a great connector, you're a great writer. So there's like all these ways. How how have you kind of explored your own areas of advocacy? How did you approach it? Yeah, I um, I definitely have been writing more because I realized okay, this is something that. And I want to acknowledge that sometimes it's hard for us to see what we're good at because it took me almost, almost like 25 years until like, oh, I can write. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I just yeah, yeah. always thought like, oh no, I'm not like this prolific, profound writer. I feel like I'm not that great with words. And then um, I realized, wait, but I have an interest in it. And I'm really realizing to be an expert at something, you just have to have curiosity and interest. It's not like some people we just wake up, like professors wake up being professors, or people who are experts in their field wake up being experts. No, it's it, it's born from curiosity and interest. So I have a love of curiosity and interest for words and language, and yeah. because of that, that's what that's why I read. Um, that's that's why I read a lot. I make time in my week to read as much as I can. That's why I um, do morning pages and I journal every morning. That's why I you know when something happens. When something happens um, and I just don't know how to process it, I just start writing. And then that, that's how I just started um, 
just posting stuff online, like I'm going through this, whether it be about my mental health conditions, about my MDD, my GED, my ADD, whether it be about coming into terms with my queerness, um, whether it be about you know Asian American identity and what that means to me, and more specifically, really understanding my Korean American identity without the hyphen. Like, what does that mean? How do I hold both of those? So, as we've been sharing it, I just I realized the things that resonate most with people is when I'm just sharing it so that I can get it out and I'm not like I'm gonna say this so other people can um, I'm just I'm just sharing openly and those are the stuff that I think what what resonates the most I'm realizing okay it's my role as a storyteller and as an artist as a, a writer is to synthesize my experiences um, in a way that is healing for me and that in turn the side effect of that um, I hope will be healing for others too Right. So I think that, that's that's right. that comes from yeah, and that comes that's from just right. my my thing. And I'm also thinking lately a lot about um, what purposeful defiance means mm -hmm. and what resistance looks like to me. And I've been uh, listening to uh, Asara Shakur's autobiography on um, on Audible. I've just been listening to the audiobook, um, and it's really, really cathartic to listen to someone else go through their journey of resistance and defiance because it makes you realize so many things that we just accept as the, because of the status quo or because of the systems of power, we don't have to accept. Right. We don't have to accept it as is. We can, we can ask why. We can ask the question. We can push back. We can say, why is, the de why is this the deadline? Why is this the, why are these people leading this project? Right. Why did you decide to hire this person? Like, I'm, I'm no, really like, legit, like, why? <laughs> right? Like, why? <laughs> I, mean, I just want to know. And the thing is, what that does also, some, too, it can do a couple things. It can, it can sometimes piss people off, and, you know, yeah. that's a side effect of creating change. But also, it can make people think about it because oftentimes we're functioning in default so we don't think about it. Right. So when you ask why, when you say, hey, can you help me understand? Can you um, can you give me a peek inside your thought process for this? Right. Then it forces people to look and be like, uh, what is my thing behind this? <laughs> because it always was or it's always been like this. Yeah. Or because, you know, we, we don't do, if it's a no, if someone says no, they say, oh, we haven't done this before. Right. Or, you know, there's no precedent for this. And, we're I, trying to and I also think to that, to, to your point, that uh, learning to be purposeful in defiance and learning to um, really uh, integrate the idea of resistance and what that looks like and knowing that resistance and defiance is not inherently bad, right? Mm. It would be like saying anger isn't bad. It's just mm -hmm. information, you know, that you need to understand because Honestly, some of the status quo things, some of the things that we do at work offends our sensibilities. I know it does. All of a sudden now, working 40 hours a week is too much. It's too much. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, um, part of going freelance for me was, I, I, I was questioning, do I have to constantly keep working even if I am tired, even if I'm sad, even if I'm overwhelmed, you know, like just questioning internally. And I don't think that that questioning is bad. So I, I, I love this idea of purposeful defiance and resistance and, and how, how we can integrate that into our own daily lives mm -hmm. and knowing that that's not bad, that like that is our way of paying attention. It's, it's our cue, you know, to each other, to ourselves, that there's something that needs to change in order for us to really enjoy ourselves and really um, learn how to be in community. There are things that I think feel very utopian and feel very idealistic. So people think that can't happen, but that's not true to your point and to Asada's point, which is if we don't like something, we can change it. It comes at a cost, but the end, at the, in the end, it will work to our advantage because don't we have the right to live in the way that we want? Yeah, right? and we, yeah. we are. So I really love that. I really love that, you know, I probably should start listening to that too because I mean, everything I read about her is just so, you know, amazing. Right. And um, I think that a lot of the concepts that, you know, you mentioned that she talks about can be 
apply, right? In terms of how do we take action every day? And um, I want to talk a little really bit question, about yeah, question everything. Question everything. Question not for the sake of just questioning, like just not, being not for the sake of just pushing back or creating confrontation, but really because we're the, it's you know really understanding like wait what needs are not being met, right. whether it's mine or the people around me, the people that I care about, yeah. the people that haven't gotten their needs met for a long, long, long time. Why are they not being met? And does it have to be that way? Right. For what? Like at what cost? Right. To what end? Um, I do want to talk about um, how someone, because I, I had this question last night, I got a chance to talk to a wonderful group of ladies, um, it is a group led by my close friend Lindsay Neal, it's called Rooted Expansion, and she brings together, you know, a group of women to really discuss, you know, the internal dynamics of being white women at work, and I had a chance to talk to them because I think that what doesn't get talked about a lot are is tension between um, white women and black women in the workplace. And part of that, um, the questions that kept coming up were, well, how do I start? What things mm -hmm. can I do? How can I be a better advocate? How can I be a better mm -hmm. ally? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to really kind of have us not only, I'm gonna expound upon what you started earlier, which was, you know, how do I basically assess my areas of advocacy, which is what are your areas of, of influence, what are your interests and passions, and what are your mm -hmm. skill sets? That's the first place to start. But then the second place, I, I, the second thing I want us to think about then is once you've figured out what that is, how do you then advocate for yourself? You know, what are ways mm -hmm. for you to advocate for yourself, whether you're thinking about, you know, changing your role, Maybe you were just put into a D, E, and I <laughs> committee or role at your job, and you have to do that on top of your job, mm -hmm. or maybe you just got a new job, and you want to start it off right, and you want to start some initiatives, and you want to be able to um, really advocate for yourself and advocate for other people. So what can you do? So I wanted to give a couple of tips. The mm -hmm. first one is be clear on what it is that you need, right? And being clear means what is the actual purpose and intention behind what you need and, and the next steps to get to that. They don't have to be perfect. But the goal is to write out some of what those next steps are. And then make sure you're tailoring your messaging, the way that you communicate this, based on who it is that you're talking to. So if your goal is, you know what, I not only am I to start our equity and inclusion efforts at my job. I also want to become a, a trend researcher at work, let's just say. So the way that you communicate that new job description has to be different with your direct manager because of what, how they're involved in your job versus the CEO, which you may be pitching to him and why that is a great role for you to have. And what so that's what person has the power to influence? Like, right. What, what can they do? What is it in, in there? What is it for them? Like, what's yes, for yeah, them? yeah. Right. And then, of course, the third part is keep a journal. Keep an account of what you're doing. And keep this, like, write down the steps so that you can not only keep it for just posterity's sake, say, for mm -hmm. understanding what you did, but also, like, stuff doesn't always go as planned, right? Sometimes you'll start something and you'll put it out there and then things just get stalled <laughs> um, or you know things happen in your daily life that like kind of slow things down mm -hmm. so it's to keep track of okay I put together a plan I had a meeting with you know my CEO I had a meeting with my direct manager um, here are the next steps um, and you know they told me to work on x y and z like it's really great to keep track of all of that also so that the next time that you need to advocate for yourself you have a blueprint of what you've already done. And the last thing is just create a plan that can be shared with the ultimate decision maker, right? So you make a plan for yourself, but then make the, you know, it can be a loose plan for the decision maker so that they understand how they can come in and help you. And then you can also understand what they're having to make decisions about so that they can assess mm -hmm. your need and your request. 
So I, I, I want us to, um, to be able to talk through that because I think advocacy is a muscle that we absolutely need to build because it's way more collaborative than it is competitive to be an advocate. And as we are, are thinking about, okay, how do we re-vision community? This is another way of being in community and in right relationship with each other at work. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I want everybody to be able to say, you know what, that was really great. I'm going to go home and I'm going to write out a plan and I am going to, you know, start this plan. Right. I want you guys to feel, in, you know, really kind of empowered to say, I do, I do want to be a better advocate. I do want to help myself, but I also want to help other people who um, maybe don't, aren't as visible as they need to be at work. And so it's good when you have a blueprint and a plan so that you know what steps to take. Mm -hmm. And it can be something that also help build confidence too, because when you have something that so much of why we don't speak up in the workplace or in these settings, whether it be, you know, uh, advocating for a better rate for ourselves or advocating for someone to get hired uh, when someone says they're not a quote cultural fit, which we need to abolish that language. Yes. Um, but that the reason why we freeze in those situations is often because we freeze in because of fear. Am I going to say the wrong thing? Oh, I want to say something, but I don't know exactly how to say it. Or um, I don't want to say something and then uh, it, it might affect my reputation of this company or my trajectory of this company, you know, so or with this or with this client, whatever it is. So I think a lot of a lot of the time we don't do things out of fear and what you just shared can help build the muscles and the confidence to say, you know what? I at least have a blueprint for myself. I'm not starting from scratch. And also writing them, I'm, I'm a big proponent of writing things down too. Oh, yes. Write everything. Like every, <laughs> you know, yeah, like all your dreams, what you, you know, just reflections, things you learned this week, whatever it is. Like I'm a big note taker. And what that does also is help synthesize information in a different way. And then it makes things a little bit more concrete because it's one thing to be like, okay, I'm going to. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, you know, be on this DE&I committee and show up. But what does showing up look like? What does it look like? It can be a plan, the, the plan, and what this, what do I want out of it? What do I need out of it? What do, what do I want them to do? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big proponent, uh, proponent of writing things down. I think Erica had to, uh, the meme that she shared, or actually just advice and wisdom that she shared was, you know, write some shit down and watch it become real. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I have always been that person, like when you come into my room, I can hear about this too, where there's like post-it notes all over, you know, um, yeah, I have the yeah. post-it notes and I have the big post-it notes um, of just kind of like my schedule, but also like I want to travel. Uh, if there's a new project, it's like, it's, it's basically my mini way of keeping uh, my goals and my awareness, right? Um, mm -hmm. These are the things that I really have intention behind. These are things that are really important to me. So, like, I just want to be able to see them and be reminded about them all the time. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's something that um, that's something that you know anyone watching this can do immediately after this. Maybe do three key takeaways. And just what did you get out? Oh, get out of this conversation. What are some things that stuck with you? And that's going to look different to everyone. But even just writing that down will help. It helps kind of solidify something in the brain, so that it it makes things feel a bit more. Um, it just helps build that muscle. It makes things feel a bit more real. And a prompt that you can use is what are. Um, what can I do to expand my area of advocacy? Or what is it that I have, um, what what can I do to identify my area of advocacy, really, if we're in that stage of still identifying it? You know, what does that look like? And then just write down that ideal scenario and let, um, kind of let your mind think about, you know, what does equity look like in the environment that I'm in? What am I committing to make sure that happens? What are some, you know, some of those, some of those skills, interests, or values that I have, and then just kind of exploring what that looks like. Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely right. Those are great takeaways. And you know, I don't think I I would always tell people don't worry about um, you know if 
feeling scared or worried if you're not going to get it right because you just have to really kind of try. Or if you feel like, you know what, this is really great, but maybe I, you know, you're someone who's like, but I work in IT or I work in HR, like how can mm-hmm. I really advocate for other people or, you know, I don't ever ask anybody about their salaries. And um, the reason why I bring that up is because uh, I think I was telling you earlier, um, talking about salary and talking about money as a, as a consultant and a freelancer was a big fear for me because we're conditioned to not talk about salary, we're conditioned yep. to not talk about money. But as I started sharing like proposals, I would share with my friends, hey, I just finished this facilitation workshop, I just finished moderating these groups and I got paid X amount for it. Just in case, like you need to know, if you do something similar, this should be the base rate or more. And, right. You know, and I feel like I, I, I definitely can say that I am that friend that will tell you how much. You know, yeah. I, I don't hide how much I make on project. Um, and it, it's not that I'm bragging about it at all, but it's just like, be definitely, you you're a person of color and you were a woman, I want you to know if I can help in any way. I, I want you to know how much I make because I want you to set, at least be making that or more. Mm-hmm. And I would appreciate if you, you know, the same, if you kind of like you, you get a project or, you know, you can't do it and you pass it on to me, like let me know what's the best rate to charge, yeah. you know? And so yeah. opening up that conversation got me to think actually more expansively about money. And that has helped me not just in my job, but also like managing my money and opening investments accounts. Like I think it, it, it has rippled um, in other areas of my life. So I challenge you all to do that as well too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Definitely sharing openly about pay is something that I think our industry is definitely moving towards with the, was it the real agency salaries that came out and everything, but even yeah. just among, especially among women, especially among women of color, it's really powerful to just be like, hey, this is what, this is what I just made. So definitely don't, because we really tend to, um, to undervalue ourselves. We do. Yeah. And I think, you know, hoarding that type of information is, is honestly, it's a characteristic of white supremacy. Yeah. So I think once you know that, according that type of information, it should really free you and release you from any kind of like fear or guilt that you may have about mm-hmm. sharing that information, right? Well, because and then there's enough for everyone. Yes, as I want to remind everyone how much you make and your work, do not live in the same room. Do not start equating your work with how much you make. Those two conversations are completely different. Mm-hmm. My thought is, and my perspective is, no one can actually pay you what you're worth because you're priceless, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But, you know, because we work in a certain system, mm-hmm. we get paid based on our experience, which yep. can be commensurate to your skills and what you bring to the table. But just don't, when you start sharing money and you start you know, opening up the conversation, do not equate what your worth is or anybody else's with how much they make. Yep, definitely. I love okay. that they don't live in the same room and they're they right don't talk to each other. Really. <laughs> yeah, I think that's something that is that is a form of of the capitalistic structures we live in too. Just the you know you gotta work harder so you can make more, so you can be worth more, so that you can elevate your capital and all that when. Elevating our capital can look like resting, can look like talking with friends, can look like building our community, can look like right. building our knowledge and our information. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. All right, so as we close, we'll go into some rapid fire questions. Okay. So, um, want to go first or I, you want me to ask you first? Um, I'll ask you first. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, Three rapid fire questions for you again. What is one thing that brought you joy in the past week? Um, I think this is gonna sound strange maybe, but just uh, watching uh, babies on the beach last week. <laughs> literally, well, literally for context for people who don't understand. <laughs> 
and Jen is currently in Costa Rica. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> not in Korea, like IRL. Um, yeah, yeah. Like I've been, I've been here since since COVID, and I've turned into a digital nomad. But often I see because people are like with their kids all the time, and mm-hmm. um, the kids are always like playing and. It's, I don't know if it's just me or if just kids here are extremely friendly, but they'll come over and be like, here you go, you know, like just kind of like Aww. come and talk to you too. And they're all so chunky. <laughs> and um, that's just been happening to me like whenever I go to the beach and kind of like camp out like a, a baby will, you know, kind of like run by and like stop. And then I'll be like, I see you. <laughs> um, yeah, so that always brings me a lot of joy. Um, oh, I love that. Yeah, babies. I love that. Yes, babies are are joyful. <laughs> yes. Okay. And two, what's one thing you've conquered lately in your area of advocacy? Uh, um. Well, as I was saying about money, that that was a big deal for me. Um, just being more comfortable with um, conversations around money and asking for a rate and asking for, not asking, but I'm putting up boundaries. Um, I would actually say boundaries is a, is a big deal um, mm-hmm. in terms of work. Um, and so that's one of the, the bigger things. But also, um, I would also say, um, just speaking up a bit more and really using my voice and knowing that I um, don't have to have a big title, right, to affect change. I'm someone who's very passionate about inclusion work. I'm very passionate about spirituality and wellness. I'm very passionate about yoga and herbalism. And the fact that I have kind of uh, uh, made it my business when I see something happening, I'll email directly a CEO and say, um, did you know that, you know, like just kind of pointing things out and getting a response from them. And oftentimes that's the way I've, I've gotten a lot of business, right? People who I've, you know, wanted to express kind of, um, not my displeasure, but like kind of pointing out things that I feel like they should understand and know because they're smart business people and I bring it to their attention. They turn it to clients. Um, and I think I'm really proud of that because I don't think um, in college that I would have imagined that I'm somebody who would say, I'm going to email the CEO of her jobs and tell her what I think, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that uh, every time that I've done that, I've been rewarded, even if it's just for the experience. Yeah, I like that. I yeah. like that. And what is one thing you want people to practice professionally? Um, I would say vigilance. Um, we had a, another conversation, the same conversation I was telling you about last night, and um, and by vigilance, I don't mean like over-awareness that makes you tired or exhausted. I mean, be observant about how people communicate non-verbally in all situations, right? And I, I say vigilance because in talking to people who are of the dominant group, um, I'm still surprised when they're like, oh no, I didn't notice that so-and-so said this when it comes to like my progressions. Or um, I, didn't, I didn't realize that, um, you know, that they changed their tone when you came on. Or, you know, like you just being vigilant and being observant in work situations, or actually in personal and professional situations, actually can lead you to be a better advocate. So just start being more observant. Don't just work with your head down, right? Observe how people are talking. Observe how people move through meetings. Um, because then you become the person that can say, hey, so-and-so is trying to finish talking. Can you not interrupt? Or that's not appropriate to say. Can you, what did you mean when you say that? And you, know, and you can only bring those things up if you're vigilant and you're observant in people's behavior. So I, that's one thing I would say, I would hope that people continue to practice. So the expanding our awareness and expanding our horizons. Yeah, yeah, that's good. All right, so are you ready for your questions? I've got three questions for you. Mm-hmm. First one is gonna be the same, which is 
What's the one thing that brought you joy in the past week? Um, something that brought me joy in the past week is making um, making tteokbokki, which is a Korean dish. It's the rice cakes and this spicy kind of sweet sauce with lots of veggies. Um, and I've never made it before, so and I'm, I don't have a lot of confidence in my Korean dish cooking skills. So that's something that's been bringing me joy, the fact that I made it. And um, and just I'm inviting more ease into my life by taking a, a wellness book this week. So after a call, I can't a call tomorrow morning. Uh, but after that, I'm going offline for the rest of the week and just not taking calls, not taking any more stuff, not taking on any more stuff and just giving myself a little bit of a break and maybe doing a writer's retreat this weekend. So that's, I hope we'll, I, I hope we'll invite more joy into my life this week. Yes, I love that, Des. I'm so happy you're doing that. Um, all right, so the second question is, um, who gave you the most to think about um, during ad color last week? And by the way, you, uh, you know, got to moderate a fantastic panel. We're also proud of you. But tell us who you um, heard from that gave you a lot to think about. Yeah, um, they had some incredible speakers this year. And Alicia Garza, one of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, she was talking about how movements emerge to change the rules that organize our lives. And she, called races, she referred to racism as a set of rules, which is such a great reframe, because that is what it is, that certain people are allowed to do this while others aren't. And she also said that um, power is the ability to change those rules. And I've really been sitting with that. I think that was really profound, because if we think about that, then we can think, oh, we can we can change the rules of our interactions in our, mm -hmm. in our teams or in the people we work with or in our lives, in our space, in our physical space. Um, so I thought that was really powerful that we have the power to change those rules and that govern our lives. I, I really love that. I'm very glad that you shared that. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, okay, the last one is, what is an affirmation that's been getting you through this week? I am responsible for my own emotions. I am responsible for my own emotions. And I've been thinking about how I deserve to live a life of ease. It doesn't have to be so damn hard all the time, but um, so yeah, those two things. I am responsible for my own emotions and not other people's. Um, and I deserve to live a life of ease. I love that. That's really, thank you for sharing that. Um, and that's something I think that we can all kind of like take into the rest of our week as well. My, my personal favorite is um, my comfort is my responsibility. Because <laughs> I, 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 I am also getting over my people pleasing. So, uh, you know, I always have to remind myself that like, if you're uncomfortable, it's your responsibility to change that. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I love that you shared those. Um, okay, so we're, we're, we're right at the app. This yes, always goes yeah. so fast, you know? <laughs> um, nice to talk and then, you know, hopefully people are also enjoying the conversation as much as we are. But um, I also want to remind everybody that, you know, obviously this uh, conversation, we're, we're going to edit it and, and make sure to re-release it so that you can also replay it, maybe take some other notes, maybe share it with other people. And also, you know, equity in practice is a column that we have um, where we can, you know, basically answer more of your questions and just continue the conversation of equity in practice. So, um, again, we do these webinars once a month, but we always continue the conversation um, in our new column uh, for yes. equity in practice. So, you can send in those questions to magazine at workingnotworking.com with subject line equity and practice. And you can ask any question about, you know, how to put equity into action. What does equity look like in the, um, in your environment? Whatever question you want to ask, uh, submit it. And then we uh, might answer it in, in the next column. So that'll be released soon. And thank you everyone for being here. I think it's sort of, it, popping into the chat too, um, if you want to take a look at uh, the email. But thank you everyone for being here. We know screen fatigue is real. I mean, to be to be honest, 
I'm feeling it myself because I'm just not feeling myself today. So my energy is lower. And so, and I'm just keeping it real because it's, I think we're all just at a point where we're like, oh, okay, how, what, what do I need to be at? What do I not need to be at? We knew that this is some mandatory work event. So we really appreciate you being here and, I and listening in with us, being in dialogue with us through the interweb. Yes. And a huge thank you to everyone at Working Not Working who helped make this possible, especially Alex Mosa and Moira Spike. So yes. um, they are you. our regulars. Yes. Keep us, they, you know, on point. And they keep, and they make sure that these things happen. There's so much yes. that goes on behind the scenes. Uh, so really, thank you, uh, thank you, everyone for for help making this happen and we hope to see you next time stay tuned you can follow jen at underscore j-e-n-n-z-e-n -E -E underscore uh, you can follow me at jez chung uh, j-e-z-z-c-h-u-n-g and till next time jen until anything next else? time we'll have another one coming in october yes thanks jez all right, thank you, Karen. Bye. Bye. Okay, yeah.